My name is Cade Courtley, and this is Can You Survive This Podcast. The show is designed to teach you techniques that will increase your chances of survival if you happen to find yourself or your family in any life-threatening disaster scenario imaginable. Each episode will put you smack in the middle of a new disaster scenario as I challenge my guests to see if they have what it takes to get out alive. Knowledge is power, people. Can you survive this podcast? Hello, my fellow survivors, and if you can hear the sound of my voice, it means you're still alive, and it is my continued mission to keep it that way. Welcome to another episode of Can You Survive This Podcast? I'm your host, Kate Courtley, and today, another amazing guest. Our next guest is a Marine Corps officer, graduate of the United States Naval Academy, a third-generation military aviator who not only has thousands of hours of combat flight ops, but was the very first woman to be selected to join the prestigious Blue Angels. Please welcome Major Katie Higgins Cook. Katie, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Do you know what time it is? It's time for the game. Oh. It's time for hypothetical survival world. Let me tell you a bit about what we do here. I am gonna drop you into a hypothetical survival situation And you're going to have 10 events where you decide to do A or you decide to do B. If you choose the right one, you get plus 10 points. If you choose the wrong one, it's minus 10 points. Any question about the game before I give you your hypothetical survival situation? Um, When you ask the question, Mm -hmm. can I ask clarifying information? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So... Katie, here is your hypothetical survival situation. You've just completed several speaking engagements in London and are returning home on a 747. You're over the Atlantic with about two hours of flight time remaining. You see the pilot emerge from the cockpit to use the lavatory when during this transition, several men leap up from their seats. One hurdles the drink cart and gains access to the cockpit while the others engage the pilot and crew outside of the cockpit. An air marshal eliminates two of these hijackers before one of them comes behind the air marshal marshal and neutralizes him. All right, so here's the tally. One hijacker in the cockpit, two hijackers dead, two more still alive, now in the front with knives, one of whom has produced a briefcase and is busy at work with this briefcase. Any questions about your scenario? Um, where am I sitting? Middle of the jet. Aisle or window? Middle of the jet aisle, 747. So again, right now, you've got one that's gained access to the cockpit, two more that are armed toward the front of the plane, and one of those two is messing around with a briefcase. The air marshal has been neutralized. Okay. Okay, here we go with your first event. Are you going to remain in your seat quiet and assess the situation or are you going to start communicating with nearby passengers? Uh, if by communicating, I'm far enough away from them in the front to hear me, correct? Yes. So I would say communicating slash game planning. Um... I would probably do that. I would probably communicate. Absolutely. If we learned anything from 9-11, folks, it's, I think it's very clear what these people's intention is. It's not to go to Cuba and get a million dollars. So that's a plus 10 right out of the gates. All right, Katie, here we go. Yes, you have game planned with nearby passengers. And the decision is, okay, it's our let's roll moment. We're going to have to engage these two guys. Are you going to proceed to the front of the aircraft and try and attack them there? or are you going to try and lure them to the rear of the aircraft and engage them there? You've got the choice of attacking them in their location at the front or try and lure them to the rear of the aircraft and engage them there. Um, I would say rear of the aircraft. Try to lure them. You're trying to separate them. 
get him away from the front, which is where all the important stuff is to fly the airplane. So let's yep. get him to the front. You, na- you nailed it, absolutely. If there's something in this briefcase that might be explosive in nature, the last place you want it is right next to the cockpit. Your best bet is to get it as far to the rear as possible, away from the wings, fuel, etc. So that's a plus 20. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so again, it's let's roll time. You lure them to the rear of the aircraft. Are you going to rush these guys using hand-to-hand and numbers, or are you going to try and get improvised weapons before this engagement? Eh. They only have knives, right? This is true, but knives can... In a knife fight, the one who bleeds the least wins, but if you can limit that as well, that's probably a good thing. That's that's a little hint. Say, I mean, th- this is a weird question for me because you can get a weapon and then rush them with a lot of numbers. That's true. That's true. So is it just hand-to-hand or is it with improvised weapons? I think if you if you can get a weapon, get a weapon. I think absolutely. And folks, listen to some of the things that are available within the area of where you're seating. You're sitting on a a removable flotation seat cushion. That's an amazing shield. Uh, You can get things like laptops, belts, shoes. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can get right there in the area. You can even roll up a magazine tight enough and it'd be a great uh, stabbing object. So maximize your effort and your odds when you're going against armed guys. So there's a plus 30, Katie, keep it up. Okay, you've successfully engaged these guys. Do you subdue and detain them in the rear or do you open the hatch, the door, and throw the briefcase out? If you get this one wrong, I'm gonna be incredibly disappointed. (laughs) Open the rear door or just try and detain and subdue them. You are at 33,000 feet. Yeah, so opening a door at 33,000 feet is not smart at all. You would suck out half the plane, probably. Um, so not not a good move there. Absolutely. I was a little nervous there for a second, but yeah, massive depressurization at that kind of altitude. It's just like a gigantic vacuum cleaner in there, isn't it? Okay, keep it up. Your perfect score at a plus 40. Here we go, Katie. So excellent. You decide, let's see. Um, so what I would recommend is take, if you think something's explosive, place it against the door and then just start mashing lots of bags and anything you can do to try and create a buffer if for some reason there is an explosion. And if there is, the door will be the first thing to go. So here's the next thing you do. Do you, you've got the crew or you've got most of the passengers in the rear of the plane. Do you gather equipment to include the air marshal's gun? and try and establish communications, have some of the uh, passengers try and get on phones and say, hey, here's our situation, or is it, no, it's go time, we're going right to the cockpit and we're gonna try and make entry. So it's gathering equipment to include the air marshal's gun and try and get some of the passengers to get on their phones or the plane's phones and say, here's what's happening on this flight, or is it, hey, we're not wasting any time, we're going right to the cockpit. No, I I think you definitely need to communicate the situation because if you fail and we, you haven't given any heads up to anybody on the ground that this could be a flying giant missile just like September 11th. You know? You're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a really good chance that nobody knows what your situation is. Can't assume that, oh, FAA, is, they're on top of it. They know what's going on. They're scrambling jets. No, there's a good chance nobody knows. Take the time to try and give folks a heads up. Let them know the situation, the best of your ability, number of hijackers, status of the plane, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, plus 50, a perfect score. You're halfway through, all right? So stick it out here. All right, several passengers were able to communicate and let the folks on the ground know this is the status of our flight, all right? So you slowly start heading to the front of the plane. The plane is still flying straight and level. Do you try and give first aid to the pilot who is slouched down in the lavatory that was attacked, or do you try and make entry? Flight, the flight is straight and level as of now. Um, I obviously you don't want the dude to bleed out, so I would say like you could give you could give you could take the second to put a tourniquet on or whatever you need to him before you make entry. 
Yeah, absolutely. If, yes, for several reasons. If you can help somebody, you want to try and help them. If you've got a little bit of time and it seems like you do, it's not like you're in a, a wicked 40 degree down dive or anything like that. And this potentially be the guy that might have to land this plane if you regain control of the, of the plane. So yes, see what you can do trying to help him out. Okay, you look out the window, you see a fighter escort arrives on each wingtip. So they're well aware of what's going on. You have a fighter jet escort. The 747 now starts to dive. Is it time to make entry, or are you going to stand by and see what the uh, fighter escort is going to be able to do to help? No, because the fighter escort, the only thing they can do is shoot you down, right? So get in there. Exactly. Now, now it is go time. It's time to get in there. Okay, you decide we're going to make entry. The guy who grabbed the air marshal's handgun, he's shaking like a leaf, all right? And you're saying to yourself, are we going to use this handgun for entry, or are we gonna try and use some of those improvised weapons we used to attack the uh, other hijackers previously? Again, you were heading into the cockpit. Yeah, I would say try to avoid the gun as much as possible because if you breach the whole of the airplane, again, it's just like opening that door and stuff getting sucked out. Um, additionally, if you're shooting like crazy, like this guy doesn't know what he's doing, you could hit uh, electronics or flight controls, anything like that, and now you're dead in the water anyway so you nailed it you nailed it. all the reasons why uh handguns on planes with somebody who's scared and maybe not very well trained is probably a bad combination unfortunately he refuses to give it up and he's like i'm going in let's go in let's go in so the pilot that you were giving first aid to he is unconscious and non-responsive he has gone down bad so here's the decision you need to make are you going to be the first person through that cockpit door or are you going to be more like the third person through that cockpit door and this is all based on what have you done for a living yeah i would say definitely third um just because uh i may have to land the airplane um and likely i would if i was the first you're probably a higher chance of being killed or injured or something so if i'm third there's a better chance that i'm gonna live and then be able to land Absolutely, you nailed it. And uh, so, I mean, you have a very unique set of skills that there are probably a lot of the passengers that can fight fairly well. I doubt if anybody else is going to be able to do what you can do behind the controls of a 747. So that's absolutely right. So we're gonna do something kind of unique on this. You have a perfect score of plus 90. And basically what I wanna be able to do, and this is a little bit of a making a right turn compared to how we normally do this. I want you to finish up what you would do in this scenario and there's no right or wrong answer. I would just be curious, all right, it's a crazy scenario. This is what I do to wrap it up. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, you just scored a perfect 100 points. But here's, here's the situation. You have retaken control of the plane. You slide into the seat behind the controls, realize that some of the rounds from the handgun have destroyed the comms and you've got some unresponsiveness in the controls. What do you think you would do in a situation like that, as hypothetically outlandish as it is? Um, okay, so you have your fighter escort next to you, right? And so we have um, procedures for being Nordo or not being able to talk, right? Not, not being able to communicate. We also have um, codes that you can squawk for saying I was hijacked, I'm Nordo, all this stuff. So obviously go through that first. Um, so it's um, aviate, navigate, communicate is what they always tell you, right? So the first thing you want to do is figure out um, how 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 what is the performance of the airplane. So I'd sit in the cockpit, I'd move the controls full throw up and down to figure out what I have the capability of flying. Um, if I don't have a lot, then I need to find an air, airport that has a really long runway, right? If I have full capability with the controls, then I have a little bit more leeway, um, and then navigate where the hell am i you know try to figure out do you have a map around is is the glass cockpit showing where you are you're not going to be able to ask um you know hpc to help you so you got to figure out where the hell you are and then communicate okay so how am i going to communicate with no radio obviously the squawk that i just talked about you could literally have somebody write on a notebook and push it up against the window to talk to those people that are next to you additionally you can rock your wings stuff like that um, to give an indication to the to the uh, to the fighters that you're um, at Nordo, and so at that point they would likely move in front of you. You could follow them to an airport, and then you would uh, land 
uh, as best you can. So I would say, like, if you are in a situation where, hey, I need a long runway, that would be something that you could, like, communicate with the I need long runway, you know, just put it up against the window. Because, I mean, they're, those fighters are such great wingmen that they could tuck in real close to be able to see something like that. Right. So that, that's, that's likely what I would do at that point. Well, congratulations, Major Katie Cook. You are now in the rarefied air of a perfect score on Can You Survive This Podcast. Congratulations. Don't yell too loud. I don't want your kid to wake up. That's awesome, though. You did phenomenal. Hey, we do an AAR. You probably remember it from uh, your time in the military after action review. Anything that you learned from this uh, this time with us? Yeah, I, I like the idea of um, taking time to, to pause and getting other people involved, right? Because sometimes you, as a Marine, you're like, I'm the only one with training. I'm going to do this, right? And so um, especially if you've been a military pilot, you know, everyone on the airplane is trained the same way as you, but you utilizing those, um, improvised weapons that you're talking about, utilizing the skills of possibly other people around you, that's going to be key to being able to survive something. Like that. I love it. That, that was, uh, I always wanted to be the front, first guy through the door. And one of the best, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was a young officer was if you have the time, take the time. So I love, that's great. Um, I cannot thank you enough for spending time with us. You were outstanding. Again, congratulations to the new member of your family. And uh, we want to wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Semper Fi. Hey, thanks for watching, folks. If you enjoyed the show, go ahead and smash that like button. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. Any questions or suggestions for future episodes, leave it in the comments so you can be a survivor not a statistic. And if you want more from this guest, including an amazing interview, you can find us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Can You Survive This Podcast is a Cavalry Audio production recorded live from The Bunker in Denver, Colorado. Hosted by me, Kate Courtley. Produced by Brandon Morgan and Kate Courtley. Associate producer is Jeff Apple. Executive produced by Keegan Rosenberger and Dana Brunetti. Service, commitment, and integrity are the traits embodied by our nation's defenders, veterans, and first responders, and they are also the core values upon which the Gary Sinise Foundation is built. The Gary Sinise Foundation serves and honors our nation's defenders, veterans, first responders, their families, and those in need. Whether the Gary Sinise Foundation is providing specially adapted smart homes to severely wounded heroes, supporting Gold Star families, or providing essential equipment, training, and PPE to first responders, in all of the Foundation's programs, they honor those who so bravely defend our freedoms every day. Support our heroes today at GarySiniseFoundation.org.